East, whose performances are applauded in the West. Tonight, the marvellous Russian violinist Dmitry Sitkovetsky, who now lives in London, and his cousin Sasha, a Russian rock guitarist whose band Autograph had the distinction of being the only Soviet group selected to play in Live Aid in 1985. Gerald Fox's film follows Dmitry and his orchestra through his annual summer music festival in Finland and brings the two until recently separated cousins together in a specially commissioned piece written by Sasha for the South Bank show and called Tribe Bolero. It begins on a beach outside Riga in Latvia, where the two cousins spent the summers of their youth escaping from punishing music lessons by playing Beatles songs. Maybe we could get a gig at the local club. <laughs> <laughs> to be born into a very musical family. I think I'm the fourth generation of professional musicians on one side. And 
and I really did not have any choice but to become a musician because I heard music while I was still in my mother's womb and apparently been on stage in that position several times before I was even born. And uh, of course I heard music, I heard my father, I heard my mother, heard my aunt, my uncle, they were all musicians. So that helped, of course, to make the most favorable environment for a child to grow up. music, 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 all day, all day. I was teacher of Moscow Conservatory 16 years. I played uh, radio, TV, records, many music. And uh, we spoke in, in, uh, in home about my student, about uh, very, very good musician, about performance. Yes, this is atmosphere was with music, with music. Well, my father was a very famous Russian violinist, Soviet violinist at that time. And uh, unfortunately, he had cancer before he was 32 years old, and he died a year after. So he, uh, his life was cut short while I was still, you know, three and a half. So it fell on to my mother's shoulders to carry on you know, just the well-being of the family, just the bringing bread home. I really hardly saw her while I was growing up because she was that uh, figure that appeared occasionally in the house, you know, from concert tours, and uh, she would storm in for a few days and then disappear. Life is life, and uh, I was musician. I I must play and bring money for life. And long time Dima was only with Nani, only with Nani. I come back. I was in home maybe two or three days, and sometimes Dima explained, "Oh, it's long time. Mama will be in home three days." <laughs> Yes, but it was very good. He don't miss Mama. No. She was basically on the road. I grew up with Nanny, who became really more of a mother to me in those years than my mother. I had, fortunately, other relatives. My uncle, first and foremost. Uh, my cousin, Sasha, who was practically my age, so we had a lot of, you know, a lot of games in common growing up. So the two of us would always travel where my uncle would go. For a number of years, we would go to the Baltic Sea, uh, to the summer resort near Riga, and uh, be there for the summer season of the Moscow Philharmonic. should lend me yeah. to my uncle. To relative, yeah. yeah. But no way, you know, it was not really sad not to be with my own family, but, you know, it was fun to be with other kids, and, you know, to spend the time without, without the eye of the mother. As a young boy, uh, I started to play violin. I had to because of the, you know, the whole history of my family. 
and I uh, played violin until the age of, I think, 11, something like that. Then I just quit, and then I picked up my first guitar at the age of 15. When I grew up, my first and uh, the major influence was Beatles. Beatles and British bands of that time. Then a little bit later, Led Zeppelin, my favorite, still one of my favorite bands. You know, uh, but you know, it all depend uh, depended on uh, what kind of access to the Western, you know, music you have. Because in my case, uh, my father, who is a professional, you know, viola player, he used to tour all over the world. So I always asked him to bring me the new records. So I was always aware what's going on. But it was, you know, not really available for the majority of the youngsters at that time. <laughs> Coming back here to this beautiful Latvian resort after almost 20 years, now in 1992, uh, leaves me rather sad. All the great Russian musicians that came here to perform are gone, and the wonderful concert hall is practically deserted. that extraordinary family, which so often happens in Russia, where the tradition of father to son is still, the hereditary system survives un, survived under the communists even more than under the czars, because they kept the species separated. All the violinists were together, all the etc. You know, they didn't want any intercommunication. So uh, 
The result is that you have this extraordinary family which bridges all gaps. Had my father lived, I don't think I would have become a violinist. I don't think there would have been a need for it because it was really more than anything else, it was filling the void in the family tradition. I remember the name of Julian Sitkovetsky very well. I was a small boy in the Central Music School of Moscow, uh, and his name was a legendary name at that time. He probably was I know, seven or eight years older than I was, but he studied in the same school. Um, he had a tremendous reputation as a kind of a devilish, um, magnetic virtuoso. Um, I think I heard him probably in the school concerts, and I certainly heard some of his records. And I remember seeing him here and there, but you know, when you look at the legend, I hardly said hello to him. He was just kind of a god at that time. Yes, the reputation was quite extraordinary. When I first went to the Central Music School, which was and still is rather unique because they take you at the age of six or seven and they put you through a very rigorous system of exercises, you know, scales, arpeggios, all the etudes, you know, you have to go through one to 42 of Kreutzer and Rode and Mazas and what have you, you know, until you get to Paganini or anything like that. So. Uh, it was the best possible uh, early musical training. Выражать мысли можно не только словами, но это требует большого умения. Здесь в Московской государственной консерватории. In this middle section, maybe you could uh, give a little bit more uh, variety of colors, yes? Because those scales, they sort of sound similar. So within the scale, maybe you could do some interesting variations of dynamics and maybe watch how you distribute the bow, yes? How you, for instance, uh, between those two, which is like the bells, and you have to be strict in time. Here is more cadenza-like, so it has, has to be more improvisatory. Right?
all being trained specifically. First for school competition, then for Moscow Conservatory competition, all union competition, international competition. We were trained as athletes to win. And that is a rather negative side because that narrows the attention to a very particular repertoire that also narrows the range of uh, just the style of playing. You know, we would all be trained to play, you know, to impress with your technique, with your sound, with assurance with which you play. And we were always trained as individualists. We were never trained as collaborators, I mean, as a team. A little bit more far away. The whole Russian tradition of violin playing became, in a way, you know, the most impressive, but also in some ways the most, uh, you know, the most uh, narrow tradition of, of interpretation. Because violinists became somewhat like tenors who only really cared about, you know, themselves. And they thought that the, there's a whole world in that one single melody line, you know, and even the Tchaikovsky concerto, which starts uh, so beautifully and actually rather casually without a major statement, it would, it would sound in their own. What he's saying, just sort of waking up. You see, you don't have to be uh, expressive using you know, 220 volts all the time, you know, in the fifth gear right from the beginning. And that was very much the trend of the time, you know, and you had to impress the jurors, you know, they might not even let you play to the end, so you have to milk every note, you know, impress with every passage, you know, and the whole thing was just competition bound, you know, it was really becoming quite athletic <laughs> in its own way. Uh, by immersing myself in chamber music, you know, there, there was so many much more interesting things going on in the score besides that which is first violin uh, you know part that made me realize that in every kind of music there is an aspect of chamber music there is a principle what i call the principle of chamber music which for me the principle of give and take
maybe it's one time and get stranded at somebody just before. No, no, I was trying to, no, no, you know, the... Yeah. And I think in terms of dynamics, the first phrase is a little bit more, though it's piano, but then piu piano. And then the second half with this piano, then pianissimo. No, no, we are together, but we lose your arm there, because but it's difficult for him. We never finish the harmonia the same moment. No, that's, that, that's another one. thing, yes. yes. So I suggest we do that again. Maybe we do a uh, second half of the trio second time? Yeah. Going into, yeah? One. young student in Moscow, I knew the backstage life of famous musicians. I knew the intrigues, the compromises, the price for fame that they all, without an exception, had to pay. Within the Soviet system, there was no other way. You had to bribe the officials at Ghost Concert, had to bring presents to everyone in the bureaucratic structure. You had to pass the party commission. It had to be your passport, had to be approved by the KGB, by the party, by the Ministry of Culture, all of that. And uh, the more connections you had, on one hand, of course, it made it easier for you to get there, the more compromised you would get. So the people with the most connection who moved very smoothly within the system, were the most corrupt, inevitably. I knew it, I saw it, and I hated it. When I was 21, I came out for the first time to the West, and I came to Montreal, and I just couldn't believe the air. The air that I was breathing was different. I felt it quite physically. And somehow that feeling of being free of being watched, free of that constant psychological pressure that we lived with, that was very, very important for me. So I decided that I didn't want to be part of that system. In my mind, I was quite clear that I wouldn't have anything to do with the system, no matter what will happen in the West. And uh, you were already there, then quite heavy into the establishing the group. Mm -hmm. And actually the group w was doing quite well at that time. Yeah, I was getting That's why I was work. absolutely sure that, you know, I'm supposed to stay, I'm supposed to you know, live within the system. I was really worried that with uh, when Dima uh, leave the country, my father will be cut off, you know, all the tours and everything. I mean, he will not be allowed to leave the country, uh, to leave the country to, to, to tour, to play abroad anymore. So, uh, I was sort of, well, actually when Dima left, I even, I didn't say goodbye to him. Vauxhall asked us if we could get their new Carlton Diamond Estate into a 40-second commercial. And cut! A 
Okay, thanks everyone, that's a wrap. Thanks Ruben, great driving. In fact, we did much, much better than that. We got a 40-second commercial into their new Carlton Diamond estate. Well, almost. Your great-great-grandfather built this house from the timbers of his ship. Completed it just before he uh, walked off. He hung on to finish it for us. Even today, there are people who put others before themselves. At The Equitable Life, we pay no commission to middlemen, we have no shareholders. So no one profits from your money but you. This house will always be here for you, Henry. And I hope that one day you'll grow as attached to it as I am. The Equitable Life. Here's a secret every woman will want to know. New Superlook Secrets from Playtex. With a hidden panel that smooths and flattens your tummy in all the right places. New Superlook Secrets from Playtex. Briefs, bras, and body shapers. The secret is yours. If you've got a smoke alarm, it's essential that you carry out the following simple checks. Test the battery every month by pressing this button, and check the sensor by holding a smoking candle here. Then, once a year, replace the battery, and remove dust from the sensor with a vacuum cleaner. Look after your smoke alarm. If it doesn't wake you, maybe nothing will. Wake up. Check your smoke alarm. This is Murray. Murray is going to demonstrate that it can be a very insecure feeling getting into something what? What? without knowing exactly what you're going to get out of it. Perhaps somebody should tell Murray about national savings. Where security has never been so interesting. It's your turn. No, not even for this. Kids will do anything for the taste of Dairy Lee. Investment, pensions. Whatever your needs, whatever you are, Eagle Star covers your world. I suppose there was no coincidence in me uh, heading the festival in Finland, of all places, because I've had this, uh, since my childhood, really, a special affinity to the Baltics in the summer. And what I got in Finland even more, I've got the White Nights, the most beautiful, really, combination of the beautiful nature and beautiful music.
when I arrived in the West, uh, I had a lot of examples of similar, you know, uh, cases of performers who would come in and defect while on tour abroad, for instance, or would try to get a manager immediately and, you know, make a big story, get in the headlines and, you know, get as many concerts as you can, you know, get as famous as you can. I wanted to finish my education at the Juilliard School. As it turned out, that was probably the best thing I could have done at the time because it gave me a rare chance to get to know the West, not from outside, as so many of my colleagues who went on, never really having the time to learn the language, to get to know the culture, and to understand the mentality, which is quite different in the West than it was in Russia. I had that rare opportunity during the two years in New York. Those probably were the most crucial years of my upbringing. I was always geared up to competitions. I ended up doing quite a few. And the last one turned out to be sort of the launching pad of my career in the West. And to get that first prize of the first international free scratch competition was a great honor. Dimas playing at the Vienna competition was so completely in the highest, most intense, most dramatic, most passionate, most uh, competent, most uh, virtuoso Russian tradition uh, that uh, being, after all, Russian myself, my parents were born in Russia, uh, I couldn't but succumb. called a Guarneri player, the one that would dig in, you know, and try to produce as much, you know, sound of a... Strat actually could stand such punishment. But anyway, uh, later on, I was fortunate enough to acquire this beautiful Stradivari made in 1717, and uh, it taught me a great deal over the years. Now I've been playing on it for nine years, and it taught me a lot of different ways of producing the sound, of making the violin speak without forcing it, actually going along with overtones, going along with the natural uh, sound of the violin, rather than fighting it, rather than making it choke, which unfortunately so often happens, you know, on the violin. And uh, it's been a, a great companion, I mean, throughout the years. And uh, I don't think I would have, I don't know, maybe I would have gotten to that point if, if I'd stayed in Russia, but I wouldn't have known so much. A great deal of the Baroque practice that's been happening, you know, in the West also affected me in many ways, and uh, the result was, uh, you know, the transcription of the Goldberg Variations. I mean, to, to play now that piece and just to do the theme, I mean, in a way which would be resembling maybe some of the Baroque players. Uh, a pretty far departure from what one normally calls the Russian violin school.
after this uh, glissade so the downbeat comes from Joe and from Urban. Let's do that, yeah? Music knows no boundaries in any case. And when you take a family, you have contradictions within the family that tend to um, explore every possible alternative. Uh, they are bound by music. They cannot, it's the best thing they can do. But within that music, they search for individual ways of expression, especially as so much was suppressed in Russia, it became a political statement to excel in, in uh, improvised rock music or, or popular music. The Russian rock and roll movement was not that political at that time. Uh, the best part of it for us, we were just having a great time. We really enjoyed that. We enjoyed specifically playing our own music, and we saw that audience really liked that. And what, what else, you know, do you need? What else any musician would ever, you know, dream about? thing about it was that finally Russian or Soviet youth they got their own rock culture it was Russian rock culture not Western it was not uh, you know copied from of course there were a lot of you know bootlegging and everything but still the main the most popular bands were always original with original lyrics original music and with a lot of I would say uh, not real Russian really with a lot of Soviet, you know, influence, because it was pretty local culture. To tell you the truth, I did not uh, keep uh, direct contact with Sasha for almost 10 years, for good 10 years after I'd left. And uh, he was doing his own thing there. I was very proud of him when he came, uh, you know, to this Live Aid concert, which I watched at the time. And it was a very much publicized and I suppose the most famous moment of his life. He was watched by, I don't know, millions, billions. You know, I probably will never play for so many people as he did. Few minutes. I still remember how excited I was looking at the screens with our, you know, face on it. It was just amazing. It was amazing. And still I feel that it was the highest point in the autograph history. I knew about his successes through the uncle. And then, of course, in 88, I came back to Russia, and that's when I first saw him, as well as uh, all the rest of the uh, family and friends who I had not seen for almost 12 years. I suddenly realized that we still are brothers. I mean, I hate the word cousin. I don't know why, just, it's not Russian. You know, in Russian, nobody really used this word. And I suddenly realized that I have a brother, and he, we were separated for 10 years, 10 long years. And since 87, you know, the story just turned in another direction.
first time since playing the Beatles on the beach together, Sasha and I have been able to collaborate on the new piece written by him called Tri Bolero, which really symbolizes our renewed friendship and reconciliation. Maybe it's also a piece about our shared Russian culture. What about this improvisation? Yeah, I'll just, I'll fake it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go up and down uh -huh. just to... Okay, you know, and I'll just control to your listener. Okay. Right. Then it's fine, then you do that. that what part. happened to the second violins here? Yeah, they, they went up a little bit too far. I see. <laughs> so I spread them down. Because <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. they usually don't go up so high. Sure, well. That's why there's a second violins, not the first. I see, that's the point. <laughs> I got it. It should never be above the first. <laughs> I see two cousins together. Absolutely different style. And face is different. And color <laughs> is absolutely different. It was very interesting for me yesterday. Yes, it's very good relationship with two cousins. But second time was all right. Yeah. <laughs> Я знал, что ты уже сон. Да, да, да.
Нет, не много таких вещей, которые я не понимаю. Нет, я не понимаю. Нет, я не понимаю. Нет, я не понимаю. Нет, я не I gotta play Schumann quart uh, quintet ah, quinti at yeah. about four in the morning, ah. and then tomorrow we got the last concert yeah, yeah, yeah. with Mendelssohn. Yeah. Yeah. Rehearsal is here at two o'clock, yeah, uh, and then maybe in the church at, at between four or five. Anyway, between two yeah. and five, and then we do the concert tomorrow. Then we go on Monday to Petersburg, and then we. What is the third one? You don't understand. Thank you. 